And uh, I now call to order the June 18th, 2024 meeting of the Audit Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with Board Policy 8311, the chair of a committee, at the discretion and after consultation with staff liaison, may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's audit committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will, this afternoon will be done by roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on agenda item. As a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Jamison or Ms. Barr if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Jamison, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Lichter. Here. Ms. Frempong. Mr. Young? Here. And Mr. McMillian? Here. Thank you. Good. A quorum being present, we will begin. Ms. Jamison, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. I will start with Ms. Barr. Here. Ms. Stevens? Present. Ms. Manna? Present. Mr. Fletcher? Present. Mr. Strait? Here. Ms. Sample? Here. Ms. Crew? Present. Mr. Edwards? Ms. Smith? Present. Mr. Hartlove? Here. Dr. Kraft? Dr. Elmendorf? Ms. Forbes? Mr. Fazzino? Ms. Schumacher? Ms. Wenlin? Mr. Welsh? Ms. Hunton? Mr. Garrett? Mr. McCall? Are there any other attendees present that I did not recognize? Yeah, I think there's something wrong. Number. I think there's something wrong because none of our guests are here. Yeah, it doesn't look like they are on the invite to be on the meeting. And there's 10 have, people watching, which is more than we usually have. Dr. Kraft is an fun. attendee and she said she can't um, be joined as a participant, just as an yeah, attendee. Same with, um, Dr. Elmendorf, <laughs> he's having difficulty. Mr. Corns, can you help? Because I'm not sure what to do. Unfortunately, if they were not originally invited by uh, Ms. Gover before she uh, left, I won't be able to bring them into the meeting. We could certainly share the dial-in number and they could call in on their phones. In the meantime, I'll get in touch with Ms. Stifler and uh, let her know. And, and Ms. Barr, um, because uh, Ms. Gover is the originator of this meeting. Ms. Uh, Stifler will be able to help us as well. Um, she, uh, the the ad could not uh, uh, can't be added except by the organizer who is Ms. Gover. So uh, unfortunately, the only way we're going to be able to get these folks in is on on the telephone. Let me grab that content. And I'll put it in the chat so that um, individuals can share that with their teammates. Okay. Okay, and Mr. Jim, what do we do? What do we do between now and then? Mr. McMillian, I um, I certainly could uh, recommend some things. I mean, it it shouldn't be that long to get the names put in. So um, and 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 start to do the dial in. I don't know if the order of the agenda could be adjusted in any way to help if some folks are here or not, but that would be my only recommendation, sir. Okay, so I see it appears 27 people are on the outside. I see 27 people posted up at the top. Okay, you do what you do your thing and let's see if we can get them in here quickly. So for our viewing and listening public, 
we're having some issue getting staff into this meeting. So Mr. Corns is going to share a call in number and hopefully we can get them calling in quickly. Mr. McMillian, I have posted that dial in number in the chat. And so that could be shared out. OK, great. Now. Do I need to do that from my end? I see what it appears to be the. There was a. So what do we. I don't see that in my chat box. Um, Mr. Mamillion, I see it. The number for people to call in on is 1301. Uh, uh, um, I apologize to interrupt. That uh, number is getting live streamed out, so we may not okay. want to read it out loud. Sorry, well, Mr. McMillian, I'll text it to you, sir. Okay, but how do we get it to the people that are trying right. to get in? Um, so I don't know if we have any staff that are currently in this call that are associated with those individuals. Um, I've sent it to uh, Dr. Elmendorf uh, to uh, via text. I don't. Uh, I'll try and look down the list to see who else is um, available in through my um, my phone book. Okay, and and then and 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 why can't we send that number out? Well, they're uh, not listening, so that's one thing. They're not on it to hear it. Well, okay. and, and so, uh, and Mr. McMillian, and it would allow anyone in the general viewing po uh, populace. Now, I I don't know how many folks that's going to be. We certainly could read it out, and and have it be a um, uh, in the in the record. It it will just be that we'll have to identify every number and only accept the ones that are the staff in case we were to run run someone else into the meeting. It's not a not a huge deal. I'm I uh, apologies for interrupting. I did just didn't want it to happen with us not knowing some of the the risk that might be hiding underneath. Okay. I trust your you know professional opinion. Thank you. I believe the audit staff that is working with each of the um, management is getting in touch with them to share the information. Now, what's interesting from the people on the screen that I can see, it went from 27 to 1. So I don't know what that's about. And just to share with the listening public, that here's, here's what we're going to talk about today, just briefly. There's going to be my opening remarks. Then uh, Ms. Barr and I are going to talk about corrections or changes to the agenda. And then, of course, I just got a phone call I can't take. So, uh, then we're going to the reports we're going to do are the English English language arts curriculum procurement audit report, the e-learning attendance and grading audit report, and the Office of Science Risk Mitigation audit report. Uh, and then we'll talk about our last meeting of the. School year. OK, now my number of people is going back up to 34. Good evening. Can anyone hear me? This is uh, Scott Welsh uh, from maintenance uh, just dialing in. OK, Mr. great. Welsh, yeah, I can hear you, Scott. Answer. Great, great. So I am here. Um, I followed the prompts for. Can anyone hear me? Um, this is Doug Elman. Yes. Yes, we can hey. hear you. If, if we could just have everyone who's joined via the phone um, type your name in the chat so that I can associate a name with your phone number. We can't. I don't believe you we can can't do that because we're by way of phone. Yeah, they, they don't, they don't have access to the chat. Should we take attendance again, Mr. McMillian? Sure. Of staff? Yeah.
Ms. Jamison, why don't you do the roll for the staff again? It seems like a lot of folks have, have dialed in now. Okay. Um, Dr. Kraft? Present. Good. Thank you. Dr. Elmendorf? Present. Thank you. Ms. Forbes? Thank you. Mr. Fazzino? I know he's working on it. Okay. Ms. Schumacher? Ms. Wendland? Present. Thank you. Mr. Welsh? Present. Ms. Hunton? Ms. James, Mr. Garrett, Mr. McCall. I know he's trying to get in, Mr. McCall. Any other attendees present that I haven't recognized? Okay. This is board member from Pong. I am present. I wasn't sure if you guys could hear me when I, I got you at uh, 435 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. And this is Mr. Fazzino present as well. Thank you, Mr. Fazzino. Ms. Frempong, you are loud and clear. Thank you. I just got an email from Ms. Hunton and she says she is on and can hear everyone. Okay. Ms. Hunton, can you respond to roll call? Okay, Ms. Jamison, I'm ready to go. Okay. Hi. Oh, yes? Can you respond to roll call? Yes, Ms. Hunton, is that you? Yes, present here. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, I believe we have at least one person here from every area, Mr. McMillian, for the staff. Okay. Okay. Okay, great. Then I'm going to move on. Okay. And I uh, I apologize. How do I mute myself again? Yes. 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 Star six. Okay. Thank you. Okay. We're going to move on. Any objections? Okay, uh, listening public, we're, I'm very sorry for the confusion with this. It was an issue of staff being an, able to attend this meeting via the Teams program versus calling in. So we, we think we're squared away and we're going to move forward. My opening remarks, good afternoon. If committee members have questions or outside the scope of the reports presented this afternoon, please email Ms. Barr or me with your questions. We will follow up with appropriate individuals to get answers to your questions. Consideration of the June 18, 2024 agenda. Are there any corrections or changes to the agenda? Good afternoon, Mr. McMillian. Thank you. Yes, I am requesting the postponement of the approval of the Office of Internal Audit FY25 FY28 work plan and that a special meeting be held on or before June 28th for the committee to approve the plan. In accordance with policy 8400, the audit committee must approve the work plan by June 30th. And since June 30 is a Sunday, I'm asking that the special meeting be held sometime between now and June 28th. And I just want to say the Ms. you know, Ms. Barr had a work plan together. There's been some input from other individuals, and that's delayed, you know, the presentation of this work plan to the committee today. So we need to make some adjustments. Uh, are there any objections to postponing the approval of the plan and until on or before June 28th? Committee members, any objections? This is board member Frimpong. Uh, 
So how then is that going to work? Will we just decide amongst ourselves the next best time to meet between now and, and June 28th? And is this something that we have to do in the open meeting again? I'm pretty sure that we're going to have to do it. I've got another phone call here. I'm sorry. People are calling me on my phone. Uh, I think that's the thing about the 28th is trying to give enough time for the to get to get it out there the fact that we're going to have another meeting and and, and we meet those requirements with the open meeting act uh i'm looking at my script okay now there's a pause if there i'm reading the script now if there is an objection then process as a motion without objection the work plan approval will be postponed and a special meeting will be held on and I'm given a blank. So we have to come up with that date. Now, I'd, if if we can make the 28th, the 28th is a Friday. Committee members, can we make it? Are you available on the 28th? I'm between a rock and a hard place here. This is board member from Pong. I can make the 28th for virtual. Yes. Ms. Lichter, okay, I can make it also. What time do you prefer, either of you? Uh, we could do early afternoon at 1.30. Okay, 1.30, Mr. Young. 1.30 on Friday, June 28th. I'm checking my schedule right now. I can do that. Okay, great. So we're looking at Friday, June 28th at 1.30. And we have a commitment from, we have a commitment from the committee members. Okay. So we're going to go with that. Let me go back to my script. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Without objection, the work plan approval will be postponed and a special meeting will be held on Friday, June 28th at 1.30 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're Thank going to you. move on to reports. Ms. Smith, please proceed with the English Language Arts Curriculum Procurement Audit Report. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. McMillian, and good afternoon, board members, staff, and guests. My name is Ashley Smith, and I was a senior auditor on this project. We would like to present our audit results of the English Language Arts Pre-K through 12 ELA curriculum audit. We would like to thank the following ELA staff for being here today. Dr. Jennifer Kraft, Director of Office of English and Language Arts. I also would like to note that this audit report is posted on our website and is on board docs with tonight's meeting agenda, and if you would like to review it in more detail. So our audit objective was to ensure compliance with BCPS requirements related to the process for selection, procurement, implementation and evaluation of ELA curriculum, which includes digital resources for all pre-K through 12 students. The audit period included procurements from fiscal year 2018 through fiscal year 2024 to broaden the population to include a review of all the procurements for both elementary specific and secondary specific curriculum. So we reviewed the elementary ELA curriculum for fiscal year 18, 19, and 20, secondary ELA curriculum, which is still in process, fiscal year 24, the reading intervention, which was fiscal year 21, and foundational skills, which is still in process, fiscal year 24. Our audit identified five commendations and zero findings. So I'd like to begin by just reviewing some quick background information. ELA is an office within the Department of Teaching and Learning under the Division of Curriculum and Instruction. Their mission is to empower school communities by providing high quality professional learning 
and culturally responsive anti-racist curricula to facilitate high expectations and equitable access so all students have the opportunity to reach maximum potential. In accordance with their mission, the ELA staff works to identify, purchase, monitor, and then revise the elementary and secondary language arts curriculum to re provide resources for responsive instruction that is customized and it's personalized for all students. The process of selection for the selection of the instructional materials is governed by policy rule 6002, instruction selection of instructional materials, and then additionally incorporating some federal, state, and district requirements. So first I'd like to review the commendations in the audit. Commendations are areas within our audit that we reviewed with no exceptions or findings. First, I just want to thank the Office of Language Arts personnel with their prompt response during this audit process. Dr. Kraft was very helpful and very responsive, so thank you for that. As part of our audit, we wanted to touch on um, their communication that we had throughout our audit and to our audit requests. The director of ELA was prompt and responded again to all audit requests and provided very detailed explanations when follow-up was needed. We also reviewed documentation of the SOPs. The director of ELA continues to refine this documentation process in order to provide organized, consistent, and complete electronic procurement folders that support compliance with the policy and rule 6002. ELA staff plan and implement training over new curriculum. Additionally, there is asynchronous training materials available in school Schoolology for staff hired after implementation. Curriculum is also reevaluated re throughout the pilot during the contract period and before renewal by using surveys, focus groups, and data analysis. Evaluation results are then shared with the board's curriculum committee. And lastly, MSDE updates. ELA staff attend with monthly briefings with MSDE so that they are kept up on changes in any state requirements and meeting notes are then shared with all of the ELA staff and addressed at monthly team meetings. Additionally, the chief academic officer receives any um, updates through a superintendent weekly from MSDE and that is also shared with the ELA staff. There was a limitation within our audit and that was due to the cyber attack in November of 2020. Some of the requested documentation was not available for review for the elementary ELA curriculum procurements that were initiated prior to that time. And lastly, we are happy to report again that there were results of the internal audits review. We disclosed no reportable issues with the process for selection, procurement, implementation, and evaluation of the ELA curriculum. So I'd like to turn it now over to Dr. Kraft if she would have anything that she'd like to add. Thank you so much for uh, the report and for working with our office. And I think that um, it helped us continue to refine our process just by participating in the audit. And so uh, I just wanted to thank you for uh, the work of your office and, um, and the full report that you've given. Thank you. Hey, that's all. Okay. Okay. Uh, Committee members, any discussion on this item? Uh, Ms. Frempong, I said hand raised, please. Good afternoon. Um, this was great that this was a audit that did, that had favorable findings, um, meaning no issues. The only question I had was um, for the scope. Um, I noticed for elementary ELA that the dates were pretty far back. It went back to um, fiscal year 18. Um, but then for our secondary ELA, it's actually still in process, and those are more recent, um, fiscal year 21 and fiscal year 24. So why the that discrepancy or distinction um, with going so far back for elementary ELA as compared to the, new, the more recent years like the other ones are? You're, on, you're muted, you're on mute. You're on mute. You need to unmute. I'm sorry about that. Um, we looked at the curriculum that was being used currently um, 
within the each of the areas. So in elementary, there was some curriculum that was being used that was put into place in fiscal year 18, some in fiscal year 19 and fiscal year 20, where in, for secondary, it's um, in the process of being updated in 424. So that's why we looked at what's being used currently within this most recent school school year. Got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Step or uh, committee members, any more questions? I've got one. Dr. Kraft, I've received several questions from a concerned citizen, and I'm going to try to consolidate them and uh, into you know maybe one a couple broad questions. And I'm I'm just curious. I think the person makes an excellent point. You know the, the results. You know, let's just let's let me. The review process looks great on paper, the individual says, and then she she goes to point out, how about the kids? How about the kids in these pilot programs? That you know, we try these pilots and then we make a decision to go a different direction. So, how about the kids? And and the and I think the question is. Is is worthwhile? To, you know, when are the kids going to be first in this process? So we do a pilot. We we look at the information. We say, okay, we're not going to do that. We're going to change directions and, and go a, a different route. And then those kids now, you know, so often people say our kids are way behind as as it is. So now we've done this pilot and we've made the decision. Is there a, it's some better way? that we can go about this, that the kids, we aren't, you know, and to use this woman's phrase, you know, they're guinea pigs. And is there some other way that we can go about doing this where the kids aren't the, the, you know, the subjects to see if it works or not? Dr. Crabb, what do you think? Um, so thank you so much for that question. And, you know, we really do try to center our students first in all that we do. Um, and the purpose of a pilot is exactly to make sure that we're not putting forth a five to seven year contract for something that students don't engage with, that it doesn't move data. Um, and so uh, when we do pilot materials, we've gone through, um, there's actually a three tier process, which, um, which is why this, is, this question dovetails nicely with the work that has been done. Um, an internal audit. Um, so they were actually looking at, well, what is our process for selecting materials? And so, you know, the first thing that we do, I mean, obviously we follow all of the 6002 process, um, is we issue um, an RFI looking for a very specific product with criteria that we've outlined. Um, and then when those materials come back in, um, we then review them with a rubric, and the rubric is based on those criteria that we put out. So it's, it's really not, it's a completely transparent, there's no secrets. Uh, the rubric aligns to the criteria we put out. Um, anyone that meets the, the, that basic criteria goes to a more in-depth. Um, in that second round, um, we actually have lots of stakeholders involved, so parents, uh, teachers, teacher leaders, administrators, um, central office, um, even community members um, that, you know, help us review the material. Uh, we then typically go to a vendor review. So we've narrowed it down even more based on that second round review. Um, and we have the vendors come and present so we can see the materials more. Um, at that point, sometimes we're, we're down to more than one product that is very favorable. And I think the best example I can give you is in elementary, we had narrowed down to one product. Um, in the first in the first round, um, and we piloted it, and we got a lot of feedback uh, about that it was not working in BCPS for a variety of reasons. Um, and so we were we then were able to pivot to our second highest product, um, and the result of that pilot was very favorable. And and as such, we put that forward. Um, and so what I would like to say is that we're not trying to make um, you know, students guinea pigs for sure. Uh, what we are trying to do is make sure that the product we select um, has been thoroughly vetted. And part of the student process is, uh, Mr. Mendelian, is actually having focus groups with students. So in addition to going and observing instruction, 
Um, we do uh, two different things. We do surveys of students, and that usually, you know, obviously happens through their English class or ELA block. But then we do focus groups or interviews with students to, to actually listen to, do they like the stories? Or is it engaging? What did they, is it too easy? Is it too hard? What did they like? And so all of that is part of the process so that we can really make a good decision um, because at the end of the day, it is about the student and whether they're engaging the material because they're not, if they're not engaging in the material, um, they're not going to learn at a high level. And so um, I, we, do, we do always try to get down to a product, um, but that doesn't mean that's always the product that goes forward. Um, did that answer your question or do you want yeah, more specific? Yes, it does. And I, and I have one follow up to that. During the evaluative slash vetting process, how much of a of an analysis do we do of of these different products having been used out in the public school, you know, across the country? Uh, um, do we do we look? That, yep. Go ahead, please. Oh no no, finish your question. Sorry, I got excited. Go ahead. No, that's that's it. Just looking at okay. it out there where people yeah. are already using it and analyzing yeah. their results before we bring it back and, and implement it in a pilot within our setting. Yes. So that is 100%. Now, here's the interesting part. Within the RFI, we ask for references. Um, and so I obviously always call those references. Me or somebody on my team calls those references. Um, but what I like to do is in addition to that, is I like to scour the internet and see who else is using it, right? So somebody that isn't necessarily listed on their reference list um, and call them. And so I'll use the example of secondary uh, because I, I just recently called um, a couple of districts. I mean, I basically cold call, right? Um, I found a district, uh, Boston Public School, and then I found um, Chapel Hill um, School System in North Carolina that have both used um, study sync for four years. And I felt like that was a good time to say, would you do this again, right? So I reached out to both of them. I said, I know everybody's busy. Would you mind spending a few minutes with me? Here's why. Both, um, both uh, districts got back to me immediately, set up and I've talked to both of them. Um, and so part of our work is, is doing our due diligence. And so we, would not put something in front of students that not only have we analyzed the lesson plan, so we actually, just to give you a granular level of detail, we actually, as a team, take different grade levels and we pretend like we're still in the classroom and we plan a lesson. And we're like, how hard was this for us to plan? Do I have everything I need? What, what's missing, right? So we literally put ourselves back into that, like, all right, I'm planning for instruction tomorrow for the students staying in front of me. In addition to talking to districts that are not, not have just used them for a year or six months, but I'm looking for districts that are in that three to five year mark. So they're probably coming up at the end of their district. And the question, um, their renewal contract, the question that I always say, would, are you planning to put this up for renewal? And so those are all pieces that we do when we take very seriously. And so there's a lot of behind the scenes work um, hours and hours and hours of work that happens for us to get to a point to feel good enough to say we're ready to pilot this, uh, you know, moving forward. And so we look at school districts in Maryland, and in fact, we were able to um, obtain across the state of Maryland what every single, um, for secondary, I'll stay with secondary for a minute, what every single secondary um, program is using um, in 6, 8, and 9, 12, and we made a chart that showed who was using what, and then I looked across the United States to look at other districts that are using it, particularly that have large diverse districts like like our like BCPS. And so we really are looking at like what did the state data say? How is it moving? And and all of those pieces are taken into consideration. And so I appreciate you asking the question and and like um Ms. Smith noted a few minutes ago, we're constantly improving our process. So I would say that the RFI that I did three or four years ago, that since then we put even more um, things in place to ensure that we have the most rigorous process as possible because we want, when we put something forward to pilot, we're saying, we're, we're like, we're like, okay, we're like gonna go steady or we're gonna like be engaged, right? 
Um, and we're going to be married once we put the contract forward. So we're saying like, hey, we really think this is it. But before we get married, we're going to go ahead and make sure that this really is compatible with our Schoology system. It's compatible. Our students like it. Our teachers feel like they can plan with it. Administrators feel like they can support it. And when all of those things happen and is successful, then we move it forward for a contract. Dr. Kraft, thank you very much for explaining what goes on behind the scenes and is not visible to us. Ms. Lichter, had, Ms. Lichter had a question. Um, it's more of a comment. This is, this is an example of when the, our committee's kind of work overlaps because a lot of what Dr. Kraft just described is what has taken place in our curriculum committee and the questions that the curriculum committee is asking when a pilot is brought to us. So I just wanted you to know that there is another check and balance going on um, not only with this audit, but also with the work that the curriculum committee does. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Kraft, thank you. Ms. Smith, thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on. Ms. Sample, please proceed with the e-learning attendance and grading audit report. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. You're um, I'm sharing my screen. I'm wondering if you can see. Yes, I can. Okay. Again, thank you, Mr. McMillian. Good afternoon, committee members, staff, and all others attending. I am Sandra Sample, one of the senior auditors in the Office of Internal Audit. We completed the e-learning audit and issued the final report on May 30, 2024. The report can be found on board docs for this meeting and it is posted to internal audits website. As we discuss the results of the audit, Dr. Elmendorf, Executive Director for the Department of Academic Programs and Options, and also Ms. Julie Forbes, Director of the Virtual Learning Program, are here to address management's corrective actions. Okay, so the e-learning program provides BCPS students in grades six through 12 access to courses in a virtual environment. The objective, the audit objective was to determine e-learning requirements for attendance, grading, and instructional support for e-learning students. We reviewed the current school year, the 2023-2024 school year for this audit. Um, I'd like to briefly discuss some of the data um, related to e-learning. As of March 15, 2024, there were 676 e-learning students as of March 15, last March 15. The majority, uh, 506 of those students were in e-learning by choice with the remainder in e-learning by designation or were um, home and hospital students. Um, an example of a designation could be a student is designated into e-learning because of a discipline decision. Next, um, we show the e-learning students requiring educational support. As of last March 15, 36 e-learning students had IEPs, 91 had 504 plans, and 26 for ESOL students. Um, I'd like to note that during the current school year, the e-learning program is separate from the virtual learning program. The virtual learning program provides both synchronous and asynchronous learning, and students can learn both live and self-paced. Students are co-enrolled co with their primary brick and mortar school. With the e-learning program, students participate in live classes with teachers and other students. Now, starting with the 2024-2025 school year, the e-learning program and the virtual learning program will combine into a single program called online learning, which will be a combination of synchronous and asynchronous learning. Okay, before discussing the results of the audit, I'd like to talk about the commendations. The first commendation relates to cooperation. 
Dr. Douglas Elmendorf, Ms. Julie Forbes, and Mr. James Fazzino all fully cooperated with this audit and made themselves available whenever requested. Second is regarding communication, which relates somewhat to cooperation, but I'd like to apologize I'd like to point out that in addition to making themselves available, Dr. I'm sorry, Ms. Julie Forbes and Dr. <laughs> Mr. James Fazzino were prompt and provided detailed explanation of all information we requested. And third, members of the e-learning staff are extremely knowledgeable and very aware of applicable guidelines and regulations. It is good to know that whenever we discuss any aspect of e-learning, Ms. Forbes and Mr. Fazzino could explain the guidelines that were applicable. Okay, so there were three issues or results that we noted in this report. And I will discuss the first and second result and then turn it over to management since they're both related to attendance. Um, for the first result or the first issue, um, it, it's regarding the BCPS attendance process that requires staff to manually review and correct daily attendance. We reviewed 800 recorded daily attendance records for 40 e-learning students for the month of April 2024, and we found that 328 or 41% of those records needed manual correction or reconciliation. Um, some examples of manual correction or reconciliation would be um, the overall daily attendance that's present for the day. But when we looked at attendance for each period or class of that day, the overall attendance should actually be a half day. Um, another example, overall attendance said that a student was absent for the day, but the student actually attended 69% of the classes for that day. Uh, for example, and so overall daily attendance should actually be present instead of absent. And so staff must go in for every student to make sure that daily attendance records are accurate every single day, for every single day. And we learned that this was happening because the attendance system defaults to present for each day, um, for each student, and does not automatically update as corrections are made. Also for the month of April, 2024, e-learning staff lost access to focus for two days. Our recommendation here is to establish a more routine reconciliation process to ensure attendance is accurate and to review the current attendance taking process to determine if options are available for a more accurate and efficient process. Next, I'll go to our uh, second result, which is related to attendance. Um, as we review the daily attendance records, we saw quite a bit of question marks in focus, um, which meant that nothing was recorded for the student for that day or for a class. And we, le we learned that e-learning teachers could forget to take attendance or, or enter attendance late. And so for this finding, we recommend that e-learning teachers are provided with attendance training and to reinforce attendance requirements for teachers who frequently fail to take attendance. And now I will turn it over to Dr. Elmendorf to discuss management's corrective action for um, the first two results, findings one and two. Thank you. Can, you, can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Okay, awesome. So if it's okay with the committee, I'd like to share some context as it relates to attendance in a virtual environment compared to that of a physical environment. Um, do I have permission to do that? Is that okay? Sure. Okay, so um, the reason I want to do that is because the criteria that were used in this audit are from the Maryland Student Records System Manual. And as you'll see on page 10 of the audit, the third bullet specifically says, because these, this manual was designed with students being in person in mind. It says a student is absent or not attending if the student is not physically present on school grounds and not participating in instruction or instructional related activities at an approved off-grounds location for less than 10% of the school day. 
Well, that's pretty much nobody, obviously, in the e-learning program. So I just want to point out that the criteria that's being used, you know, in 2024 will likely hopefully change in the future to reflect the fact that students do learn full-time online um, in 2024 and beyond. Um, I also want to just share kind of a, a comparison. So in both uh, virtual programs, we really try to, as much as possible, uh, or when appropriate, replicate what happens in the schoolhouse, including attendance. But in some cases, it's just really difficult to replicate. So for example, you know, when I was a school principal in a physical building, if a student came in two hours late, they had to come to the office, they had to sign in and with the front office secretary, the front office secretary then um, deemed them to be late and marked that in focus and then life went on and, for, and attendance was likely recorded um, accurately as a result of that process of physically going into the office and um, indicating that you're late. Obviously that is not a, a, a in, in virtual environment either. So I just wanna point out those two kind of con contextual comparison kind of items, um, just for, for, like I said, for some context for the rest of the results here in the, in the, in the forum. But um, these two are very much related and I appreciate um, being able to address them together. Um, as was stated, one of the things we're doing next year, which we're very excited about, is we are combining e-learning and the virtual learning program because they are very similar to one another, although they're not the same at the moment. Um, one of the things that we're doing as we combine them is leveraging the fact that they're going to be streamlined. And we're, um, before we even had the results from this audit, we're uh, trying to refine our attendance procedures. Um, in large part, we are leveraging the best practices that we have created and refined in the virtual learning program to um, be contagious, if you will, in the e-learning program or in the combined program that's, that's going forward. So as was um, suggested in the um, report, we are going to be working diligently over the summer and in the fall to make sure that we can refine our attendance processes. We're looking at best practices across the country. There are um, for-profit companies who do this all the time um, across the country. Stride Incorporated is one of the largest ones and they obviously take attendance. So we're gonna be doing some research to see what some of the best practices are for taking attendance in a virtual environment and then um, make sure we communicate to our staff as to what those are and train them on how to, to take um, attendance in a more accurate manner that really represents um, attendance in the virtual environment. Thank you. Thank you very much. Committee members, any questions? I don't see any questions. Dr. Emmendorf, I have two questions. Yes, sir. It's most, and I say this probably more often than I need to, but I taught school for 35 years. <laughs> and taking attendance was a responsibility of the teacher. I don't understand how people can go in a classroom and not fulfill up, you know, the, you know, it, it, we used to be told that that was like a legal document that if something, you know, that you had to show whether the child was, you know, in school or not in school. And I don't understand how people are not doing this. Any comments? Y yes. Uh, well, I, as a person who has been a physical principal in a physical building, I can tell you that it's not that problem is not um, indicative only to an online environment. Um, I think teachers are so. Um, interested in making sure that they're addressing the needs of the kids in a finite amount of time that sometimes attendance taking um, is something that is not uh, remembered. I can tell you that my front office secretary in, in the school I was in most recently made daily calls to classrooms saying you need to submit your attendance, you need to submit your attendance, which is something we're looking to do in the virtual environment where uh, someone in the quote front office can determine daily um, whether or not attendance has been taken and if not, they can contact that teacher and say, you need to take attendance, you forgot to take attendance. One of the good things about virtual environment is that Google Meet um, does pr provide a, a list of folks who are in the meeting, whether it be adults or students, um, at the end of the meeting, um, does that automatically. So there are some advantages to being online, but there are obviously some of the disadvantages that I mentioned as well. But um, I guess I would say in, in summary that uh, attendance taking on by behalf of teachers is not something that's uh, only happens in the virtual environment, and we're going to look to um, uh, hold folks accountable for taking attendance just like we would in, in a physical schoolhouse and refine those efforts in the virtual environment as well. Okay, thank you for that answer. And how about cameras? Are the cameras going to be on in the new setting? 
That's Do the a great kids question. have to have the cameras on? That, yeah, that's um, a really good question. It depends. So what we're not doing, I'll, I'll start with this. What we're not doing is we're not doing what we did during the pandemic, which is nobody needs to turn on their camera. We'll just assume you're there. So you'll see, I think, in the report here that it says specifically that students need to either turn on their camera when attendance is taken to show that they're there, or they need to turn on their microphone um, so that we know it's not someone else that logged on or that the student logged on and, and went away and didn't come back kind of thing. So. Um, what we're talking about this summer is, so right now we require students to do that once during the class period to, to make sure that they're actually there at some point. We're talking about increasing the frequency with which we request our students to either put their mic on or their camera on. Um, and so it depends on what's happening instructionally. So if, if students are doing some independent work, the, the need to have a camera on isn't as great as it would be if there's a, you know, a class-wide discussion that's going on where teachers want to see students' faces and, and see how they might be interacting with the other students in the class. I would encourage you to increase the frequency on that, but that's up to you. Okay, thank you very much. Ms. Sample, thank you very much for the report. We're going to move on. Mr. McMillian, we have one more yes. finding. We have one more finding here. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Ms. Sample, please continue. Oh, no problem. OK, so the third, the last issue um, is related to grade code for missing assignments. Uh, we found that there are inconsistencies of which code to use when a student missed an assignment or did not turn in an assignment. E-learning teachers inconsistently use the lowest score LS grading code, which is a 50 percent score instead of the missing M code, which calculates as a zero for the missed assignment. If a student does not turn in anything at all, there is a concern that giving them a 50% instead of a zero could artificially inflate a student's grade. Um, we learned that the BCPS grading and reporting procedures manual contained language that allows for the interpretation and use of grading codes. The grading manual says that codes may and can be used. And because there's room for interpretation, uh, we recommend that e-learning staff consult with the chief academic officer to ensure consistency in the implementation of the grading manual. Training and support should be provided to e-learning teachers to ensure that they understand and adhere to the established guidelines for grading missed assignments. I will turn it back over to Dr. Elmendorf to discuss management's corrective action. Thank you. Yeah, as you'll see in the document here, Dr. Um, DiDonato has already um, put into words uh, some of the corrective action on her part. Uh, I think, as was alluded to, what the e-learning staff was doing as it relates to grading was not incongruent with the language in the grading and reporting manual. Rather, this is, and we discussed this um, when we went over these findings, this, this finding is really a finding of the grading and reporting manual uh, more than it is a finding of teacher grading because, um, as I've heard at board, board meetings, um, this is a concern that um, folks bring up from time to time about what's happening in our schoolhouses as well, and that is, the, um, so the variety of interpretations of the, the manual and what numbers can be and should be put in for certain um, types of performance on an academic um, assessment or activity. And so uh, the chief is very much uh, committed to updating the grading and reporting procedures manual in the very near future to be more specific and um, clear so that uh, there is less inconsistency and, and fewer um, perspectives that can be had for, for grading assignments that are not submitted. Thank you, Dr. Elmendorf. Um, so we've reached the end of this um, audit report. Once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Elmendorf, Ms. Forbes and Mr. Fazzino, and also Mr. Paul Muller for their cooperation during this audit. Um, Mr. McMillian, I will turn it back over to you. Okay, great. Committee members, any questions? I see no questions. I'd like to thank Ms. Sample and all the different curricular people that worked on this. So thank you very much. We're going to move on to our next report. 
Ms. Crew, please proceed with the Office of Science Risk Mitigation Audit Report. Thank you, Mr. McMillian. Uh, we recently completed the Science Risk Mitigation Audit and issued our final report on June 6th. The objective of the audit was to determine if the Office of Science has implemented effective controls to mitigate safety risks within the secondary science program. Before we get into the issues, we'd like to recognize Ms. Christine Schumacher and Ms. Tiffany Wedlin and thank them for their support and cooperation in completing this review. In addition, there were four other accommodations we would like to acknowledge. First, a chemical hygiene plan was developed with details that details the responsibilities of various staff and students, standard operating procedures and control measures. This plan was most recently updated June of 23. Next, multiple training opportunities are provided by the Office of Science related to mitigation of science safety risk to science teachers and science lab paraeducators. Furthermore, science educators have a process in place to ensure that only students that have signed a student safety contract have hands-on participation in the labs. Students without contracts are provided with other enrichment activities. And lastly, during school visits, the Director of Science and the Coordinator of Secondary Science um, check for ver various safety concerns in the labs and storage areas, including proper goggle uses, usage by staff and students that they've observed. Labs, classrooms, and chemical storage are also routinely checked by school staff throughout the year for safety risks. In addition, the Office of Science has recently implemented a mandatory biannual safety walk for the science school science departments. Department members tour the science area together to identify safety concerns and to review the usage of safety equipment to ensure that all staff can use the equipment. This includes eye washing stations and fire extinguishers if an emergency were to occur. Uh, next, we will discuss the two issues we identified in the audit and for each recommendation, Ms. Schumacher or Ms. Weblin, whoever's available, will discuss the corrective action. Uh, the first issue is school staff failed to provide the required documentation to confirm the safety training was completed. Our recommendation is that the Office of Science Director should collaborate with the necessary individuals who can address the failure of school staff to provide the required documentation to confirm that the staff have completed the training. I'll turn it over to Ms. Schumacher or Ms. Wedlin to discuss the corrective action plan for this recommendation. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. This is Tiffany Wedlin. Can you all hear me? Okay. okay. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Okay. Um, um, so what so we have done is we have developed an additional um, onboarding document for our science department chairs to help them navigate the initial safety training as well as the required documentation ahead of time. Um, we have a new science specialist coming on board July the 1st that will have the opportunity to work more directly with our science department chairs to ensure those, those papers are turned in. Um, Obviously, we communicate with our department chairs frequently about the turning in of those papers. It's not that they're not doing the training in most of the cases. It's they're just not submitting the paperwork. Um, so we will continue to work with our department chairs as well as um, a formal email from our director. And then if compliance is still not met, it will include the principal um, and beyond that, the executive director. But I think with the ad, um, addition of our um, science specialists, we'll have the opportunity to make sure that all of those forms are in. Thank you, Ms. Wedlin. The second and final issue is that science safety equipment work orders are not resolved timely. 
Our recommendation is that the Office of Science Director work with the Department of Facilities Management and Strategic Planning to develop and implement a process to prioritize critical science safety related work orders to ensure that all safety related work orders are completed timely. Again, I will turn it over to either Ms. Schumacher or Ms. Wetland to discuss the corrective action plan for this recommendation. Uh, thank you again. It's it's Mrs. Wenland. Ms. Schumacher is on. She just uh, can't speak, so I'll speak for both of us. Um, we will definitely meet with the Office of Facilities. I believe that they are also here um, to discuss our timelines for the work orders. Um, our meeting schedule will be uh, set up to ensure that those meetings occur quarterly um, and to work with facilities to determine which um, which of the work orders are um, more immediate or prioritized or should be a priority area for um, our to fix or to come get the chemical disposal or the eye washes or something like that. That that would be the like tier levels of priorities. Thank you, Ms. Wedlin. That concludes our presentation for the audit. Mr. McMillian, I turn it back to you for any questions. Thank you very much. Ms. Crew, I'm a visual learner. I'm curious, can you move that up on my screen? I'm seeing the, the main page. Can you move your screen? Change that so I can, yeah, 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 please. What do, what would you like to see on this? The the recommendations, the the findings. Okay, great. So here's the first okay. finding with the recommendation. Okay, thank you very much. You can leave that right there. Uh, committee members, any questions? Ms. Frempong has a question. Yes, please. Good afternoon. I actually had um, quite a few questions. It's kind of around that same thing, though, and it is with finding number two in particular. So um, it was saying about eyewash stations and or sinks not being available in the laboratory. So the Question would be how many eyewash stations are in a laboratory and then how many sinks are there in a laboratory? Is it just one in one or is it are there multiple ones available? Um, generally in a classroom, there is one eyewash available. Sometimes there's one sink, sometimes there's multiple sinks. So in the cases where those eyewash stations and or sinks were not available, what alternatives or what options were given to the students and staff to use? Uh, thank you. That's a good question. I appreciate it. Um, so generally, there is um, some guidelines presented by not only OSHA, but the Maryland State Department of Education about how far um, the eyewash stations as well as gallons per minute and, and things like that. So we do follow those guidelines. Um, for example, um, some of our um, high schools have grown and so science classes are in non-science classrooms. Um, so we have purchased um, a portable pressurized eyewash station for the classroom or there is an eye wash that is within a three second movement um, in a, uh, like a, a storage area between two classrooms. So it's always available um, within a certain amount of uh, walking distance or time to get to um, the station. Um, if that's not, if there is not one available in that particular classroom, teachers will um, switch classes to do particular labs so that they have those needs met. Um, this is obviously a more common issue in our middle schools. Um, our high schools tend to have the eyewash stations and the showers built in. Um, the middle schools sometimes all the classrooms aren't aren't uh, don't contain water or access to water. So um, each school has their own individual plan based on what is is available in the school to to meet their needs. Okay. And then um, I'm sorry, I was trying to get back to the where you guys are with the screen. So for the safety walks, then that were done, 
Um, so what I'm trying to understand is it was saying about these work orders are actually submitted, but it wasn't that it, it was that it wasn't resolved in a timely manner. So when the safety walks were done and those are being done by annually, did those identify at that time about the stations and the sinks or have that already been identified? And it still was just a matter of the work itself to fix it had not been done. Again, thank you for the question. Um, generally, um, our department chairs in our chemical hygiene plan that Ms. Crew mentioned earlier, um, our department chairs have a safety checklist that they have to abide by. So they have to make sure that the eyewash stations are in place and functioning properly um, every year at the beginning of the school year. They have to make sure that the goggle cabinets are in full working order. They have to make sure that it's, uh, you know, fresh water, <laughs> clean water um, coming through those eyewashes and um, showers. So most of those work orders have been put in prior to um, the safety walk that was just this spring. Um, but sometimes as more um, safety, um, the checks come in, more work orders also follow. Uh, so department chairs are, like I said, they have a, we created a, uh, a table basically. <laughs> it's like a schedule, you know, in January, you, you test the um, eyewash station. In February, you test the, the um, safety shower, you make sure that the chemical storeroom is up to date and there's no expired chemicals. You do the chemical disposal as needed. So we do have those, um, we, like uh, Ms. Crew mentioned, that chemical hygiene plan is pretty specific on what the department chairs um, need to do on a regular basis. Okay, and then the last one, I guess, would be for the for maintenance because with the science departments doing their part as far as submitting the work orders, but then the work not being able to be addressed, my question would be, do we really have enough maintenance personnel in our facilities management and strategic planning that's able to address address the work orders? Um, it was saying there's about 1,000 work orders open at any point, and there's about 40,000 a year. And so right now with these safety related, that's an average of 50 days, which is I guess if that's calendar days, that's almost two months for getting resolution to science equipment, safety related work orders. Hello, this is uh, Mr. Scott Welsh. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. So I, I thank you for the question. I thank you for the opportunity and, uh, and, and spotlighting that concern. We are um, working with our staffing partners uh, to, to grow our maintenance staff and making tremendous leaps and bounds. Uh, for example, our plumbing staff, which has been at half capacity for a little over a decade, has become fully staffed as a result of some position classification changes. And we're making strides every day on the backlog of work orders and diminishing the amount of time it takes to standardize and handle what we call corrective maintenance work orders. What I will be doing as part of this exercise is working with our operations partners and our science partners to determine which of these workflow problems should be escalated to the emergency standard. And our protocol for addressing emergencies is 24 hours, which is substantially a, a, better, a better sense of, of getting these, uh, these safety devices functional as quick as possible. It's a very linear approach. And when you add that to heating, venting, air conditioning, uh, you know, any kind of sewage backups that might occur, but overall, I think we're making strides on improving that, and I'll continue to work with our staffing partners to, to bolster our staffing and our resources. So thank you for the question. Thank you. That was all my questions, Mr. McMillian. Okay, great. Uh, committee members, any other questions? Ms. Crew, there doesn't appear to be any other questions. Ms. Crew, thank you very much. Thank all the different people that assisted with this on the BCPS staff side and also the audit side. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to move on. Ms. Jamison, please proceed with the ADA Accommodations Audit Report. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm going to present the results of the ADA Accommodations Audit, and I would like to thank Ms. Hunton for being here with us today. She's from HR. 
This report is posted on our website and on board docs. So a little bit about the background of the ADA um, and what it means. So Title I of the Americans with Disabilities or ADA of 1990 and the ADA Amendments Act of 2008 require an employer to provide reasonable accommodations to an employee or a job applicant with a disability, unless doing so would um, cause significant difficulty or expense for the employer. So within BCPS, our EEO office is responsible for receiving and resolving these requests for workplace accommodations under the ADA. Our audit objective was to determine if ADA accommodations activities are compliant with district policies and procedures, as well as ADA laws and regulations. And the results of our audit, we identified two commendations and two findings. The commendations were we got really prompt responses from the EEO officer along with other people in HR whenever we needed an explanation or when follow-up was needed. They were uh, very good to work with. And secondly, BCPS has made ADA accommodation information and request procedures very easily accessible on the website. So any employee who had a question could easily find out how to, how to go through the process and how to start the, the ADA accommodations request process. Now on to the findings. Uh, the first finding was that SOPs have not been updated recently and are not always reflective of current practices. So we recommend that management continues to regularly review, update, and communicate the SOPs. And now I'm going to turn it over to Ms. Hunton for management's corrective action plan. Ms. Hunton, are you available? I don't think she's here uh, or she's not responding. So uh, is anyone else from HR on the call? Hello. Hello, Ms. Hunton. Ms. Hunton. Okay, well, uh, seeing that she's not responding right now, I'm going to go into the second. Um, I can hear you, yes. Oh, okay, great. Okay, um, thank you. All right, so for our corrective action plan um, for the SOP. We will be updating all of our existing ADA SOPs, um, reviewing them and updating them to reflect current practice and compliance with our applicable law. Um, we are going to draft new SOPs uh, to reflect processes for ADA decision appeals, ADA accommodation expiration and renewals, and ADA management review process. And we will be conducting a review of SOPs each fiscal year and we'll make updates as needed. Updates will be reviewed with the EO office personnel responsible for processing those accommodations to ensure that the practice is consistent with the drafting SOP. Okay, thank you, Ms. Hunton. Uh, the, second find, the second finding was that ADA documentation was inconsistently maintained. And we found that there was missing documentation in some employee files, such as the accommodations request forms, medical documents, the decision letter, and other items. We recommend that the Office of the EEO evaluate their existing procedures to ensure that they're clearly defined and consistently applied, and also to provide training for staff in um, implementing the procedures. We also recommend that management should conduct reviews of ADA files on a sample basis to ensure that they are complete and have all the required information. And again, I'll turn it over to Ms. Hunton for management's corrective action plan. Uh, thank you. Um, our team will be working with an external consultant to provide education and training on leave under the ADA and the intersection with other laws. Uh, to management employees as well as all EEO office personnel responsible for processing workplace accommodation requests. Education on workplace accommodations related to pregnancy will be provided uh, to all staff, including all EEO office personnel responsible for processing workplace accommodation requests. Training on office processes for review of workplace accommodations processes will be provided by the director of EDR to all EEO office personnel responsible for processing workplace accommodations and a re routine review of select ADA files will be conducted by office management. 
Thank you, Ms. Hunton. And uh, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you, Ms. Jamison. Committee members, any questions? Any discussion on this topic? I do not see any hands raised. So, Ms. Jamison, thank you very much for your audit and all the people that went into it. Ms. Huntington, thank you for assisting. Um, okay, we're going to move on to announcements. The next meeting of the Audit Committee will be on Friday, June 28th at 1.30 p.m. And we're going to discuss the Audit Department's work plan. Any other comments or questions anybody wants to make out there? Okay, thank you very much for the confusion at the for dealing with the confusion at the beginning of the meeting. I think we we moved through things at a rapid pace, and I hope your questions were answered. Okay, thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Goodbye. Good evening. Good night.